I said, well, you didn't hear any gunshots, did you? <laughs> Hideous! So here I am at Edgewater, loving life, voting, all my friends. And the best part is I don't have to deal with this stuff! Are you lifting your picture? My ex-wife, Estelle, drove me nuts, nuts, nuts. It started from the honeymoon. I remember on the honeymoon night, I was so excited about cutting a slice. We got to the, we went to this lake. How I rented the cottage. I said, I, I need a little, a little, who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? My wedding night, she says, I can't do it. I got gonorrhea. So I said, well, let me flip you over. I'll take you up the Bombay door. She said, I can't do that. I got diarrhea. So I said, well, get on your knees. Open your mouth. Give me a snorting. She said, I can't do that. I got pyorrhea. As it turned out, the vacation worked pretty good because I like fishing, and she had worms, too. So that So that was pretty good. You know, we managed to pull it out. She was a. But you know what it is in a relationship, you can have some good sexuality, but stupidity. Either way, man, woman, woman, man, stupidity. I remember she went to the Anne Arundel Mall and she came back one day and said, hey, I got great news. There's a new store there. Opened up, sells nothing but flavored douches. I said, what? She said, yeah, douches are rush. They got raspberry, cranberry, pina colada. I said, douches? She said, yeah, pineapple, mango. I said, great, what flavor did you get? She said, tuna. I said, bah, bit, bah, bit, bah, bit. I wanted to tear her a new one. Of course, the good thing about Estelle is uh, I learned about Fudge packing. Fudge packing! Well, it was back in the 80s and everybody was talking about the Bombay Doors, and I'd heard about the Devil's Onion Ring. And I knew that it was tight and sweet. I said, Estelle, please. 
me, you gotta allow me access. Allow me access to the Bombay door. She said, I think it's gonna hurt. I said, don't worry, baby, it's gonna be sweet. <laughs> so I put a little, she bent over, I put a little bit of brill cream on there. Little dabble, do you? And uh, I said, I promise you, just the tip. Let me just feel it. Just the helmet. Just the tip. Let me just get the tip in there. I she well, God, all right. So she bent over and spread those cheeks. And oh, I saw that fetid ring of crush today. I put the tip in, and you know what? Jesus, forgive me. It felt so good. Woof. I went the whole thing. Wow. Imagine my shock and horror when she looked over her shoulder and said, Hey, that feels good. Give me the whole thing. I said, I'm sorry, baby. A promise is a promise. I can't do it. I can't do it. She tried, though. Give me that. She tried. I remember one day I'm working on the radio all day long. I had sales calls. I was hot. It was one of these hot days. I came through the door. We had a staircase that went upstairs right when you opened the front door. She's sitting there with her legs splayed. That scamper displayed. She had her crotchless panties on. And I was like, oh, God, you know, you've married a lot of years. You don't want to see a thing. I, I threw my briefcase down. I said, Estelle, what's for dinner? She spread them legs and undulated and said, pussy. I said, great, that's what I had for lunch for three seconds. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you know, it almost never happened. Because her mother told her when, you know, I was already on DC 101 then, and her mother said, he's in this jockey, he thinks he's entitled to the slap, slap, slap of the doodad. Don't let him do it. When he takes you out of that first date, and he rubs your neck, and the next thing you know, he's holding you close, and you start glistening, there's a little bit of seepage. You look him right in the eye and say, what are we gonna name the baby? <laughs> because that'll remind him it's an act of procreation and not recreation. So when this boss jock, this Nino Grishmanelli, this Duke of Daniel, this Prince of... <laughs> when he takes you out, and you start feeling like there's going to be some action. Look him right in the eye and say, What are we going to name the baby? Well, I took her out. Down there on Connecticut Avenue, there was the old Mo and Joe's. I got her licked up. Got her back to my condo on Sutton Place off of New Bex. I knocked the bottom out. I tore it every which way. She forgot everything her mother told her. I'm like, Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> About 10 cc's worth of baby batter. Oh. I'm like, yeah! I fall over backwards, I light a camel. Then, then, she remembers what her mother told me. She said, or what, what her mother told me. She said, well, what are we going to name the baby? Well, I reached out, I pulled off my condom, I tied a knot in the end of it. I said, if he can get out of here, we'll call him Houdini! <laughs> You're too kind. Oh. Esther! Why do you do me like you do? You throw me nuts, nuts, nuts. What you let Dunham day? Oh, God. Well, I went with, well, I will get to that now. When the marriage crumbled, and she and I were at each other's throats, I decided to move out and get an apartment. All I could find was an apartment. There was a couple of Ford parkers. And, uh, and I got an apartment with them. Here's the interesting thing. I don't judge anybody. But these gay guys I live with, they used to like that they had two adjoining couches and they would face each other every night, look at each other in the eye and... Er, ink, er, ink, er, ink. And their whole idea was to achieve a shuddering shangri-la. A shuddering shangri-la. 
That was their thing. Who are we to judge? So one night I'm sitting there watching this thing, and one of them says, I got a tinkle. Bruce, don't you dare achieve it. Don't you come unless I'm back in here. He said, I won't. So the other guy goes to take a whiz. When his buddy comes back from the bathroom, there's cum all over the TV set, on the ceiling, there's dangling globules. The curtains are smeared. His buddy said, you promised you wouldn't come. He said, I didn't come. I farted. I'm not above enlarging the circle of my friends, but a thing like that is... So I eventually went for a cooter for hire. I thought, well, this town's not going to work. I can't go to these fudge back and roots, so... So I bought me some scare, but there was a place down there on Shady Side where there were some ladies in there. That... Yeah, there's a little shack down there, you know, you can... You can knock on the door and uh, I went in there looking up one night and I, uh, the, they were very nice, you know, they used to have the old slot machines and all the thing left was oars and I, I, I got one and I knocked the bottom out of it and I, I left and I went to pay and the lady said, well, who'd you have? I said, I don't know who I had. She said, well, I need to know who you had so you could pay if you had Lula Bell. It was $25. If you had Lily Bell, it was $50. If you had Winnie Bell, it was $75. I said, I think I had Liberty Bell. She had a crack about 10 feet long. Dear Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Hit the bar scene for a while. You know what I, I, I have it I've, I've lost that I don't do anymore is dipping. Dipping. You know, yeah, you put you know quid in your mouth, little red man, spit in a cup. Skull. It took over me for a while. It did. I thought, uh, you know, it's the it, it, same as smoking. It gets over you. But when you're in a bar, you know, if you have a big old wad of slime in you, yep. It's hard to close on these days, so uh, I had a wad in there, and I met this unit. I mean, oh, good. Arthritis in both hands. I, she was unbelievable, and she kind of took her like it, I mean. So I didn't know it, but she had her red-headed cousin in town, you know, that? She had her period going on. I had a quid in my mouth. I didn't want to tell her that I was chewing. She didn't want to tell me that she had a plug in. Next thing you know, we end up at the hotel. The lights are low. Finally, we turn out the lights. As soon as it got dark, I took that quid out of there and I put it on the nightstand. Little did I know, she pulled that plug out of there. She put it on the nightstand. You can see what's about to happen here. I tear it up. Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? <laughs> We're lying there in love's bliss, smoking a cow. Suddenly she says, well, you know, I better scoot. I got to work tomorrow. I thought, Nurr. before she turned on the light, I'm fumbling around on the table finding my quid. I got the tampon. Put it between my cheek and gum. She's fumbling around. She found my quid, slammed it up, buried it deep in Rattlesnake Canyon. Neither one of us knows what happened until she goes in the bathroom, turns on the light to take a whiz, and I hear this blood curdling scream. She goes, Look at this. You gave me VD. I spat in the sink. I said, Blah. Look at this, you gave me TB, you fuck. <laughs> A little confusing. I got out of it. I don't have to deal with it, dear Lord. I actually got into the religious business for a while. Father Grace Manelli. 
Well, I went to this, uh, it was high on a hill. Like, well, I would have called it a monastery, a cloister, whatever it was. There was priests there, there was nuns there. And I get there, and it's my first day there, and I'm kind of excited. And everybody's talking about how we're all going to bond, and we're going to live a holy life of reflection and contemplation. Just then, the gardener comes in with his garden. It looked like a rockfish. Somebody, it was huge. He said, hey, everybody, look at this son of a bitch. And the nun said, my God, we're in a cloister, we're in a monastery. You can't say that. He said, no, the, the name of the fish is a son of a bitch fish. It's indigenous to this area. That's the actual name. She said, oh, well, in that case, I'll, I'll cook that thing. So the nuns, you know, get ready. She's slicing it, dicing it. Here comes Mother Superior and says, wow, that's quite the fish. And the nun says, yeah, you like the size of this son of a bitch? <laughs> Mother Superior says, my God, I'll have you think front. You get talk like this in a monastery. She said, no. Gardner told me that's what the name of the fish is. It's indigenous and it's a son of a bitch fish. <laughs> and the uh, Mother Superior said, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll cook that thing. And then the Monsignor comes down, walks into the kitchen, goes, man, something smells good. Mother Superior says, you like the way that son bitch smells? <laughs> he goes nuts. And of course, they explain it's called a son of a bitch. He said, oh, in that case, I'll serve it because the new priest is coming to town. So the new priest comes in. He sits down to dinner. Everybody's eating, laughing. Tongues are wagging. And finally, the gardener says to the priest, hey, how you like that son of a bitch fish? I caught that thing. And the nun says, well, I cleaned that thing. Mother Superior says, well, I cooked that son of a bitch. The Monsignor said, well, I served that son of a bitch. New priest was confused for a second. Then he smiled and said, well, I don't know about the fish, but I think I'm going to like working with you fuckers. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I was disappointed with that. So I left, and I decided to join a missionary group in the Congo. And uh, me and two other guys, we went out there to bring the word of Jesus to these people out in the woods. And the next thing you know, we're surrounded. It was people that probably uh, hadn't seen honkies for a while. Next thing you know, there's drums playing and... We're all locked up. It was We were deep in the bowels of the Congo. And we're all tied up. I had ropes behind my hand. I said, we're missionaries, for God's sake. Finally, the chief with his pendulous belly came out. He said, I speak your language. I was trained by the Jesuits. I said, chief, dang God, dang God. I said, what shall I call you, chief? He said, you may call me... Bob. I said, Bob, look, we got a problem here. We're here to bring the word of the Lord. All of a sudden, we're tied up. He said, I'm sorry, I can do nothing about that. My people use you as entertainment. You are not supposed to be here. You will face either death or kutanga. So the three of us are standing there. I said, Bob, and Chief. So the first missionary I'm with, he said, you know what? I can do the Lord's work better if I'm alive. Give me Kutanga. Well, this guy comes out of the crowd. Big, muscular man with a love club on him. Must have been 10 inches long. Thick as your wrist. I mean, that thing was huge. Next thing you know, he's got the first missionary bent over a log. He's too dead deep in the Bombay doors. Who's Who's in there? Everybody yelling, Kutanga. Finally, he drops off 10, 15 cc's worth the baby batter. <laughs> he pulls back. The crowd sees his muddy truncheon as he waves it. Everybody else, good day. My missionary buddy's lying there weeping and seeping. So the second guy comes up. The chief says, what shall it be? Death? And the guy said, well, that was the most humiliating thing I've ever seen. 
I don't want to be penetrated like that, but I need to be alive. Dear Lord, forgive me. Give me Kutanga. Everybody else, Kutanga, 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 Kutanga. They were in a frenzy. And sure enough, another guy comes out, another guy with a love club. Oh, yeah, you're going to pound it, ten penny nails in a marble. He runs up to this guy and, oh, right into the devil's onion ring. Oh, oh, oh. Guy's just facing the sand and finally, oh, got him by the hair. Worse than Ned Beatty ever had to go through it, right? Oh. Nelson. Finally, he comes to me. He said, what shall it be? Death or a good tanga? I said, let me tell you something. I have my dignity. I have my pride. I don't care if you can. You know what? I'm not. Give me death. Crowd was silent for a second. The chief said, let it be death. By Kutanga! <laughs> Fortunately, I survived, but I don't make any noise when I fart anymore. <laughs> Hideous. 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 Now, a lot of people say, my girlfriend, especially, she's not here. What, what's wrong with you? Why do you find these kind of things amusing? I said, now, honey, a lot of people find them amusing. We don't mean nothing. I think it's all because of my daddy. Oscar Grace Minnelli, you know, one time he made me make love to Large Marge. Just to test me. He said, you don't have to do that to knock the bottom out of large marge. I said, Daddy, I will knock the do. He said, well, then you don't have the courage to uh, feast on the yeast. I said, Daddy, you want me to bury fish on large marge? He said, I don't think you've got the guts. So large marge came over one day and... I said, Large Marge, you know, I'll tell you what, I'd like to tear you up. Daddy doesn't think I have the guards, and I'd like to go south with the mouth. She said, all right. Well, she leaned back, dropped trowel, and I looked at this hideous, cavernous, hairy. I mean, there was, there was enough foliage on there, they could have filmed an episode of Lost in that thing. Hideous. And large boy said, get it, get it, boy, get it. Like a big dog. Right, like a big dog. I went down there and I, oh, God. To this day, the memory. So, I get down there in the target area. The I said, Lawrence Marsh, why, we got that stink like that? Why got a stink like that? She said, I don't understand it. I mean, every morning I get in the shower. And I start from my head, and I wash down as far as possible. And then I start with my toes, and I wash as far up as possible. I said, well, damn it, wash possible one of these days. <laughs> Such a thing. She said, we go eat it, you ain't going to eat it. <laughs> All right, so I wafted away the flesh. <laughs> I put my face. In Rattlesnake Canyon, and I started a slurping and a honking. It wasn't too bad until I heard her guts grumbling. Next thing you know, she lets out a rouser. It was an eyebrow burner. Oh, woo! Oh, ah! She said, You all right down there, son? I said, Yes, Marge, I am. Just keep the fresh air coming, please. Like with Lars Mars, I remember one time we were quail hunting, and he said, uh, Son, ask the farmer if we can hunt some quail on his land. 
I said, I'll do that, Daddy. So he sat there in the F-150. And I went up to the door. I said, sir, we're going to, if you don't mind, work well, huh? We're going to shoot on your farm if you don't mind. He said, well, that's nice of you to ask. Most of these hunters, they just come up and tear down my fences. And he said, would you do me a favor? I got an old mule that's about to die. He's been on my farm for years. And I got to put him down, but I can't do it. Would you mind shooting my mule? And then you can hunt as long as you want. I said, sir, it'd be my pleasure. Sorry you go through this pain. He said, thank you for doing that. So, Daddy, since he was always busting bulls, I decided that uh, I'm going to play a trick on him. I went out to Daddy in the truck. Daddy said, what did the guy say? I said, he didn't want any of us Southern Maryland inbreds hunting on his land. <laughs> he said, get the hell out of here. I tell you what, Daddy, I'm not going to take that. I'm going to shoot the shit out of his mule. <laughs> to teach him a lesson you can't talk to a grease fidelity like that <laughs> so I, I jacked around at the 870 i went up to that mule and bang shot him dead and all of a sudden to my shock and horror i heard bang 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 i ran back to daddy in the truck he said quick get in boy i just shot three of his cows oh. <laughs> that's why i drink <laughs> Well, I got problems. I have, I have issues. I have issues because of childhood bullshit. I remember when I was 16 years old, my daddy said to me, you got a piece of ass yet, son? I said, what kind of question is that, dad? He said, I don't want to have any boy in this house 16 years old ain't knocked the bottom out of something. I said, well, dad, I thought I'd meet a girl we date for a respectable period of time. There'd be an engagement. And then we'll get married and... He said, what, are you fighting some kind of fight? I said, Daddy, what? He said, here's $20. You go out and get a piece of ass tonight, or you don't come home tonight. Yeah. Well, I went out. I came back. He said, you get yourself? I said, yeah. I went over to Grandma's house. I gave her $20. I tagged it, nailed it, flipped her, dipped her, snarling, fudged back. And... Daddy said, what? You're fucking my mother? I said, of course, you're fucking mine, ain't you? <laughs> ah. It was oh. twisted! Oh, I remember the first time I saw my father's cock. Oh. I was in the bathroom tinkling. He came out of the shower. He had this big ropey, oh. vascular, and I just hit it, dangling like a donkey dick at the zoo. He stood there toweling off. I said, Daddy, when am I going to get a dick like that? He turned around and said, just as soon as I lock this bathroom door. about daddy he was involved with the wind talkers remember that let me button this down one thing you can't do on the radio is use your hands for these kind of things and daddy was involved with the wind talkers you saw that movie with the navajos that saved our asses because the japanese people didn't understand that navajo lingo and when you know when daddy ran on the beach on d-day he dived into some shell hole and there was a guy with a helmet on with two pigtails hanging down. And Daddy said, oh, I heard about you. You're a wind talker. But the guy didn't speak any English. He was like, oh, Dad, yeah, blah, blah. And Daddy said, oh, thank God you guys are here to save us. You are uh, one of those wind talkers. What are you, uh, paratroopers? Guy just looked at him, said, infantry? Are you... Artillery? <laughs> Forward observer? At that point, that Native American hauled ass out of that pit, dived into another hole, there's another wind talker in there. Oh. And they speak in the same lingo. The guy said, these Marines are crazy. I just had some guy tell me that when the sun goes down, everybody walks away, he's gonna fuck me up the ass till my eyes bug out of my head. <laughs> Unbelievable. Never get 
scared to use your hands. If I remember when I was a little boy, we didn't get to use our hands. I, I remember we used to have to do that in elementary school. And uh, the lady said, use your hand to describe your speech as you're talking. It'll help the deaf people. So I got up there one time. I said, uh, ladies and gentlemen. The teacher said, my God, stop, stop, stop. You're going to do that. Here's how you need to do it. Ladies and gentlemen. I said, oh, I'm sorry. So I went up there. I said, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you tonight. Thank God I didn't have to do a whole lot of radio hell. Using my hands. But I tell you, when it came to being a law man, I got a little liquored up. And that's why I'm watching my drinking tonight. Don't want to drink too much. And I remember one night, it just, you know, sneaks up on you. Your, your, your contact. I walked into this clock repair shop. I took out the hydraulics and the doodads and I laid them right on the countertop. Sploosh. The lady said, sir, officer, I think you misread the sign. It says clock repair shop. I said, I know that. Put two hands in a face on that. When I turned in my badge and gun, there was this one prostitute I had my eye on. And uh, I decided when I wasn't the police anymore, maybe I ought to see what $1,500 a scamper buys you. So I went up to her and I said, you know, I got the $1,500 with my retirement bonus. I uh, kind of want to meet you. She said, well, you're going to lock me up. I said, no, nah, I'm not the police anymore. I just want to see how you can sell that thing for $1,500. Oh. So we get to the hotel room. She's like, all right, I'll, I'll just tidy up in the bathroom. She goes in the bathroom, takes her squat. When she comes out, she's shocked to see me sitting at the edge of the bed naked, achieving a shuddering Shangri-La. I'm like... <laughs> I said, lady, for $1,500, you are not going to get the easy one. Ah. Ah. I, just, I don't want to keep you. I took a trip. I took a trip south of the border. And uh, the first trip down there, this is pretty hideous. I'm a gringo, clippity clopping, clippity clopping, and this guy, Juan Corona de Vega, pops out of the bushes, points a Winchester at me, and says, Get off that hard, gringo! I'm tired of you, gringo bitch, coming down here every day, hobbling our wheeling, taking advantage of our oil resources. Just then, my horse let fly a plop right here. He took a shit. He said, okay, Gringo, eat that. <laughs> what can I do? He's pointing a Winchester at me. <laughs> he cocked the hammer back. He said, you eat it, Gringo. So I took a fork. I was starting to eat that horse. <laughs> oh, it was hideous. Fortunately, horse shit's mainly hay, but I'm still eating it. <laughs> he gets such a big kick out of it, he laughs. His horse rears. He falls off. I catch the Winchester. I pointed at him. Uh, All right, buddy. Uh, you eat that. His horse lets fly. I say, you eat it. Uh, eat that shit right now, one car on the man. <laughs> so what can he do? I had a Winchester pointed at him. So he starts eating it, he's gagging, but he gets it down. So when people ask me if I ever met the most notorious bandito in all of Mexico, Juan Carota de Vega, I say, yeah, we had lunch together. <laughs> Quite the guy. <laughs> a 
I'll be at my psychiatrist's office as soon as this meeting is over. Because I feel like I'm losing my grip. And how is that? Dreams. I have terrible dreams. Last night I dreamed, and I'm going to tell this guy that, that I was sucking my own dick. And since I knew it was my own, it, it was great because I knew where all the sweet spots were. It's my own. Working around. Here's where the dream goes south. In the middle of it, I realize this isn't my dick. It's somebody else's. Oh, merciful Jesus. I knew that. First clue. The dick was black. Second clue. I came in my, uh, my mouth after I promised myself I would. So I'll be headed for the psychiatrist's office tomorrow and explain that dream and maybe he can help me come to grips with the kind of man I am. But I want to say thank you for coming and being a part of this. Woo! So anybody wants to get a picture or hang out, linger longer, quit parking lot snarling. <laughs> Do that on your chin. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Come on now. We'll just kind of laugh, have fun. My dog lives. And thank you for being here. Thanks for coming to Come Get It. Yeah. <laughs>